So let's dig into the first point, but that's the rock that Moses struck portrays Christ, who was struck once for our sin. He's our abundant living water. And then number two, the Ten Commandments reveals that we're forever holy before God by repentance and faith, not works, before or after. So number one, the rock that Moses struck portrays Christ, who was struck once for our sin. He's our abundant living water. And so as the Israelites left the Red Sea, they were confronted with their own inability to provide. And and it's interesting how God led them through the wilderness, this barren wilderness where they they had to continue to look outside themselves. Their backs hit the wall when their limited food from Egypt ran out. God knew this and, and knew that it would, and he continued to cover them as he waited for them to come to the end of themselves and look to him and to him alone to provide. Um... He will not share his praise, his position, or his glory with another. He wanted to be their sole provider. Um, He wanted them to see that his provision for everything was in himself. And that's what he did in providing the manna we saw earlier. Soon their limited supply of water ran out. No wonder they're walking through a barren wilderness as they're going. And so here's the question. Did the Israelites see their helplessness and God's desire to bless from his unlimited supply? Did Israel make those connections? They were helpless but God was not, that God desired to bless. Did they make those connections? Or what was their response when they ran out of water? They started grumbling, didn't they? They responded in anger. Why? Why did they respond in anger? What what did that give evidence of? Of their pride, isn't it? They wanted God on their terms. They were demanding of God. Did they have a right view of God? Can any of us demand of God? They refused to humble humble themselves and admit that they existed for him. They weren't learning that God should be their sole provider as he had proven themselves in their slavery, as he had proved themselves at the Red Sea and in manna. They failed to see God in the cloud overhead, that he was continuing to cover, that his provision, they failed to see his promise that he was going to take them all the way through and that he desired to, 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 to supply. So let's read again how God gloriously provided in Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17, verses 5 and 6. Five and, and the six. Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of, at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Okay, so, so you're Moses with an angry mob in front of you and a solid rock in front of you. And God tells you to do what? So put yourself in Moses' shoes. God tells you to pick up that staff and go to that rock in front of everybody and do what? Strike the rock. What are you going to do? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. But we question. But what had we experienced? What had we seen God do before our very eyes? Will we not strike it with confidence? Will we not strike it realizing that, that God had done so many countless miracles? And what had God promised Moses? He was going to go where? What does it say there in verse 6? I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. And so Moses wasn't going along. God promised to go with him. So now notice this. God could have miraculously provided the water just like he did the manna. But this time, he asked Moses to assist. He asked Moses to be involved. And there's some pictures there that we're going to see as we go. So how did God richly provide for these rebels? How did God richly provide? Send water from the Send water from the... How much water? Yeah, enough for how many people? 2.5 million of them plus all of their animals. So this was not just some little trickle out of a rock. This was the equivalent to 900 tanker trucks of water gushing out of solid rock. And so now you're Israel picturing this in front of you. This was no small trickle of water that came, that came gushing out. So are you shocked? One moment you're cursing God, and the next moment your need is met coming out of solid rock. So let's make the connections between the rock that Moses struck and Christ who was struck for our sin. Um, Christ was beaten and struck for our sin in order to become our abundant living water. Now notice 1 Corinthians here, uh, verses 3 and 4 on the board here. So they all ate the same spiritual food and drink, for they drank from the same spiritual rock that accompanied them. That rock was, what's it say there? That rock was? Was Christ. So how is Christ like that rock? Making a connection, 
This, this rock that Moses struck, that they drank from, is Christ. How so? He gave them living water. He, gave them living water. he provided how much water? Abundant. Abundant, right? So Christ was the rock that Moses struck. Have you ever seen this connection before? Huge truth here that God wants us to see. So flip over in your Bibles, and let's just see why and how he was struck. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Notice, notice the strength of the verbs. We considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted. He was pierced for our righteousness. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are, we are healed. Isn't this violent? Like when we, when, we talk about, when we talk about this truth here that portrays Christ who was struck... When we talk about Christ being nailed to the cross, when we talk about what he has provided, do we look at it through the lens of what he went through? Like as you read the, the, the verbs that come out of here, stricken, smitten, afflicted, pierced, crushed. So to what level, to what level was Christ struck for your sin and for my sin? To what level? Have we ever looked at it, how violent the process was that he went through? Isn't this shocking? So why? So why did he have to, why did he have to be struck? I thought we had a loving God. So why? So why, why all these adjectives? God doesn't just kind of put these in here for nothing. Why? What's he, trying, what's he wanting us to understand? Why did Christ have to go to that level? Why was it this violent, and why did he experience that much violence? He took our punishment. He took our punishment. The punishment for? Your sin and for my sin. The sin, that, the sin that we slapped Almighty God with, the sin that defied him, required that Christ was struck. And it was violent. It, was, it, was, it, it, it cost him. The innocent was crushed for the guilty. And we've got to see this in all of its light. So let's pause to look at the initial connections between Moses striking the, and the rock and Christ being struck for us. Christ was struck when we were at the height of our sin. This, the rock was struck at the height of Israel's sin. Uh, Christ was struck when we didn't deserve it. And, and God provided water from the rock when Israel didn't deserve it. Just interesting coincidences. Uh, Christ was struck to provide abundant life through his shed blood. The rock was struck to provide Israel with abundant volume of water. Uh, Christ fully satisfies all who drink of his abundant life. All Israel was satisfied who drank of the, of the water that God provided. And Christ satisfies for all of eternity, not just temporary. Now remember Jesus' is worse the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, everyone who drinks the water, this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what does this say about Jesus, our provider? As we understand what he's provided, we understand the, the, the violence that he went through to set us free and understand why he's come, this spring of water welling up to eternal life. What does all of this say about Christ who is our provider? Notice Exodus. Go back over to Exodus chapter um, 17 again. And we need to look at this in a couple of different translations because there's, there's some different wording that comes out. And uh, notice, notice, I'm going to read it in the NIV, and then I need somebody to read it from the ESV or the King James to see, the, to see some wording here, because I think there's, there's a sense of meaning that comes out through here in, uh, verse, in verse 6 of chapter 17. So notice what it says here. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the, Israels, uh, the, of the elders of Israel.
Did you notice the difference? I will stand there before you, NIV says, by the rock. King James, say, King James says, I will stand there before you, where? Upon the rock. ESV, I think, is the same. Who has ESV? Yeah, read, ESV, read the ESV. This is the first part of ESV. They're on, they're, on, they're on the rock. And this is a huge, as well, God was very specific to Moses to say, to strike the rock with what? What was he smite the rock with? With a staff. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 20, called Moses' staff, the staff of God. So both were the design and plan of God. We contributed nothing. Both were provided as we come to the end of our limited resources. Now notice this. Both were struck by God, the staff of God at the rock, and as well, Christ was struck by the wrath of God. Both meant that God was struck. He was struck on the rock, and God the Son was also struck for your sin and for my sin. An interesting coincidence? This was your sin and my sin of what he provided. Later when Israel ran out of water again, God told Moses to do what? He told Moses to speak, to speak, to speak to the rock. But instead, what did Moses do? Moses struck it, didn't he, out of anger, and God, and God judged him harsh, God judged, judged him for that. Now Moses might not have understood it, but he broke a picture of Christ, a picture of Christ and the finished work of Christ, and to God this was huge. Christ died once for all sin, past, present, and future. Christ's one death completed the payment of sin and satisfied the wrath of God. There was nothing more to, to, for him to be struck again. Christ accepts us completely through our one-time repentance and faith. So God is not to be trifled with. When he provides, he completes it the first time. Do, don't dare to suggest that Jesus' death was deficient. Don't dare to suggest that he lied and said at the cross that it is finished. Don't lie or don't, don't, don't uh, accuse God of lying by saying that it wasn't sufficient. So let's apply this. How much did Christ provide for us to be right with God? How much did he provide? Was there anything lacking? Anything lacking? Everything was provided. So consider this for a second. How might we be like Moses in striking Christ a second time? How might we be like Moses in destroying a picture of Christ and saying that your death on the cross was not sufficient? Here's a, here's a case in point. There's some of us that believe that we must do something to complete Jesus' death. He didn't pay for it all. He just paid for this, our sin in Adam. I need to be baptized to complete it. I need to be really sorry. I have to really believe. I have to do fill in the blanks. So what is this belief doing, and how is that similar to what Moses is doing in striking the rock a second time? How are they destroying a picture of Christ? Do you see the connections? They're saying that what Christ provided in the, on his death on the cross, that once, that once struck once, is not sufficient. We've got to strike him again, as it were. We've got to complete that act. Which that, that initial one wasn't sufficient. So what do we need to do with this belief? We need to trash it because Christ, notice, Christ, um, Christ was struck once for our sin. He is our abundant living water. Here's another one. What are we saying if we, if, we, if, we, if, we believe, if, we, if we fear that God is out to get us? And I think my, my paper, if we're and we're still under his wrath. There you go. So what are we believing if we go forward as a believer in Jesus Christ that I'm still under the wrath of God? What are we saying about Christ? What are we saying about what he provided on the cross? He says it's not enough. And if we hold on to this belief... Are we not like Moses striking, God, striking Christ a second time? And dare we trifle with a picture of Christ? So again, what do we need to do with this belief? Trash it. Huge. Huge thing to, to understand. So let me illustrate how believers need to go forward with intense anticipation, resting in Christ's provision. Imagine somebody giving me, giving me a bank card, unlimited funds on it. And he told me, you don't ever, never have to make a payment. Just use it and use it. It's going to be always provided for you. Now, what would happen, what would you think of me if I put this in my pocket and took my own credit cards out and used my own credit cards to provide for all of my needs and worked furiously to make all of the payments thereafter? What would you think of me? 
You're crazy, right? Give me the card, right? <laughs> You'd want the card. So God hasn't given us that unlimited supply of money, but rather he's given us his unlimited self. He's a spring of living water inside of us that's springing up to eternal life. He's transforming our thinking. He's transforming our attitudes, our speech. He's ending our fear and our shame and causing us to live out our identity as sons and daughters of the king. But so often, what do we do? We don't believe in his sufficiency. We don't rest in what he's provided. And we're trying to meet our own needs. We're trying to satisfy our own needs through our own strength, our own ideas, our own resources. And we're frantic and working ourselves to the bone. But the whole time, we have his unlimited supply, as it were, at ready avail. All we need is, all we need is found in Christ. He was sufficient for our rescue from our sin and Satan. He's sufficient for everything that we need in life because he's come as the living water, that abundant living water that's, that's, that's springing up to eternal life. Christ provides as we come to the end of our own limited resources, recognizing our need and looking to him. Our sufficiency will run out, but his will never. Amen? And so think about this as believers in Jesus Christ. The truth is we have not because we ask not. We have not because we don't really believe that what he's declared to be true. When we're faced with a situation that's impossible outside of our limited resources, what do we often do? We throw up our hands and, and, and exasperation. Why? Because we're trying to meet our own needs in our own, by our own provision. And God wants us to recognize and humble ourselves and recognize that he is sufficient and he is there available. He is that rock. That rock was Christ. And that rock is there, struck once, to provide us abundant living water. So God wants to change our thinking. It's not what I bring to the table. It's not what you bring to the table. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. Each and every situation, of each and every, at every point of our life, He is sufficient. Isn't He good? See, this is the relationship that He's drawn us into. This is, this is where he's wanting to take us. Do you, do, you, do you get a sense of his longing? Do you get a sense of his desire and his passion? Why would we not? Why would we not? Let's go on to, let's go on to point number two. So the Ten Commandments reveal we're forever holy because of Christ, not by works we ever did or will do. And so we're with Israel. Right now we're with Israel. We're at the base of Mount Sinai. In other words, with the base of Mount Sinai, how did God come down to them on the mountain? As, God came to, as they came to Sinai, God came down to meet them. How did God come? How did God meet with them? In a cloud? Thundering voice. Earthquakes. Like it was a shocking deal, wasn't it? The whole mountain shook as he descended in fire. And so Israel backed away in fear as God, God's voice thundered. And if anybody stepped over that barrier at the base of the mountain, what was to happen to them? They were to be killed, weren't they? So if God wants this, wants a relationship, why is he seeming to push Israel away? Like as I was going through this and looking at this, like if God is desiring a relationship, but as he's descending on this fire, descending with earthquakes and bellowing voice, or earth-shattering voice, Israel is cowering in fear. So if God wants a relationship, why is he seeming to push them away? He's showing, he's showing them their holiness, his holiness, and establishing that the only way for them to come to him is in, on the terms that he, that, he is, that he reveals. See, God is absolutely holy, and for mankind to have a relationship with him, what do they need to be? They have to be exactly holy as his. No sin in the past, no sin in the present, and no sin in the, fir, in the future. And so God is revealing this as well, that he's absolute owner, and that mankind exists for him alone. And while God seeks relationship, man has to come on God's terms, not as equals. And so God is revealing the way that they can come to him. He's revealing who he is so they could understand that. And now think about this, where Israel's at in this whole juncture. Has Israel been wanting a relationship with God, or have they been pushing against him, pushing against and resisting him? And yet God comes down, still extending himself for these rebels? Isn't that, inc isn't that incredible? So if you were Almighty God, would you do that? Would you extend yourself even further for these ones and speak with them? 
See, it's in God, God's absolutely incredible to see who he is. So God came down to them in love and wanting, them to, wanting to draw them to himself. Israel refused to humble themselves, and so as a father would do for his child, he gave them an object lesson. So the question is, what did God want to reveal to Israel through this object lesson of the Ten Commandments? What was God wanting to reveal to them? Yeah, to see our sinfulness, right? to bring them face to face with their sinfulness and their helplessness, right? To drive them to their knees, as it were, in repentance and faith in the coming deliverer. Galatians speaks of the Ten Commandments as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And so Israel, of all people, shouldn't have needed this elaborate object lesson to drive them to their knees. Why? Because they knew the history of their people, that by nature God can't accept any of us through through our own means, right? They knew about their forefather Abraham. They knew how God had accepted Abraham, Jacob and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob, through repentance and faith. This is in their oral tradition, in in their story. They also saw firsthand what God did to the nation, of, the nation of, of, of Egypt when they lifted themselves up in pride. They saw and they had a front row seat as God decimated these ones who lifted themselves up in pride and saw God destroy uh, the Egyptian army. They knew of God's covenants that were made by God with nothing required for mankind. They knew about the coming deliver, the promise of the, of the Messiah that was all based on what God would do. So the covenant, so now think about this here for a moment. Now understanding what Israel knew as God came to them with this, with this uh, covenant of the Ten Commandments, this was completely different than all the other covenants. And that should have been a red flag to Israel as they began to understand it. All the other covenants required no input for mankind, but the Ten Commandments were solely based on what they would do and their performance. So think about this. Why didn't God give the Ten Commandments to Abraham? Why didn't God give the Ten Commandments to Abel or to Noah? Why to Israel? Have you ever made that connection before? Why why to the Israelites and not to Abraham? Why not to Isaac? Why not to Jacob? Why just to Israel? You ever made those connections before? Why did God only give this covenant of the Ten Commandments to Israel and not Abraham? Yes. So Abraham, how, how quickly did Abraham respond in repentance? Immediately, he responded in repentance and faith. He didn't need all of this object lesson to drive him to his knees because Abram, when he looked at himself, he quickly realized his helplessness and there's nothing that he could do. And he humbled himself in repentance and faith. And so Abram didn't need it. So now if you were like God, it was like God was saying to Israel, psych! But was Israel getting the point? Because what God was doing is putting something out in front of them that was completely impossible for them to obey. It should have been red flags for them all over the place. There's, God, you're asking me to do that? There's no way I can. But did Israel get the point? Did Israel get the point? What are they, how do they respond? How did Israel respond in Exodus chapter 19? All that, what did they say? All that God said, we will do it. 24-7, their entire lives. They figured that they could do all that God listed. How foolish. Take your Bibles and let's go to Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Because again, we've got to see the continuity of all of of God's word. So what God is doing for Israel here in the the Ten Commandments has to fit with all of Scripture. How God dealt with Abel is the same way that God is dealing with Israel. And we've got to connect those dots together. Otherwise, we're going to get confused. And there's lots of people that don't understand why God gave the Ten Commandments. And they begin thinking, okay, that's the right way to be right with God. And we've got to see that that's not his intention at all. So uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So what a powerful object lesson. So what was God doing? What was God revealing to Israel through the Ten Commandments? Romans chapter 3, verses 19. What was he doing? 
so that every mouth may be what? What does the scripture say? Be silenced. No, sorry. May be silenced and the whole world what? Held accountable. Other scriptures say, what's the, what some other scriptures use the, another word in there? Held, sorry? Be guilty. And so then through this comes the knowledge of their sin. And God is bringing them face to face with their sin. And so initially, all of this was given to Israel. But this is a powerful object lesson for every man, woman, and child the world over. Because what does it do? It silences us before Almighty God. That absolutely no way we can be holy before God by anything that originates from us. Nothing. And we've got to see this for what it is. Repentance is faith is the only way with God that, that we can be as holy as he is. This is the work of Christ on our behalf. Now notice the next couple of verses in Romans chapter 3, 21 and 22. This is what it says. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for everyone everyone who believes no matter who they are and so God has given us and if you notice that in another in in another translation but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ you see this contrast point that God is making Because we look outside of ourselves to Christ as our substitute, he became what we were that we might become what he is. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Believers are no longer a sinner before God, but holy as God is. We are now made right with God by faith, not obeying the Ten Commandments. We didn't bring anything to the table, nor do we keep ourselves right with God. It's all of him from first to last. Notice notice this here. Don't take my words for it, but God has shown a way to be made right with him without keeping the Ten Commandments, without the requirements. Um, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. These are not my words, these are his. It's apart from the law. It's outside of it. And so again, there's not a contrast, there's not a a difficulty or contradiction here. Again, God is bringing us to Christ through this object lesson of the the Ten Commandments. And we've got to see this for what it is. See, God has always accepted sinners, has always accepted sinners through personal repentance and faith. And it began back in the Garden of Eden, even before there was sin. And so for what did God require of Adam if he was going to live forever? He wasn't a sinner, but what did God require of Adam in order that he could live forever? What did he do? Did God give the Ten Commandments to Adam? Or what did God require of Adam if he was going to eat of the tree of life? What did he need to do? Sorry? Obedient? But, but, but first and foremost, what did he need to do? He needed to humble himself, didn't he? He needed to come before the he needed to come and recognize, Lord God, you are good, loving, and gracious. All I need is found in you. Lord God, I belong to you alone as my sole owner and final ruler. Lord God, I need you to continue to lead me and teach me. Lord God, I exist for you alone. And so humility, the beginnings of repentance, as we humble ourselves before God. See, there's always been just one way to be right with God, repentance and faith, and that one-time decision sealed a person's relationship with God forever. God didn't require them to do anything to continue to be secure or to be saved. And so we've got to see this for what it is and how God declares it. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says this, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so as a believer in Jesus Christ, we come in by faith, We continue to walk by faith. We continue to live in faith, not following something external and performance on the the external. Notice what what 1 Corinthians, I love this verse in 1 Corinthians 1.30. It is because of him. Who is that? Who is it speaking of here? It's because of him. Who is that him? Christ, isn't it? So it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, or God, excuse me, it's because of God that you're in Christ Jesus who has become what? Our righteousness. He's become our holiness. He's become our redemption. And so what we have in believers in Jesus Christ is not something nebulous out there. It's bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. 
He is our holiness. He is our right standing. He is our redemption. It's bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what he is to us as believers in Jesus Christ. Our right standing doesn't depend on who we are or what we've done, but rather our right standing before God is Christ. He became what we are so that we might become what he is, and because he doesn't change, our standing will never change. Amen? See, we've got, to see, we've got to see this because so often we've divorced this relationship. We've divorced our, 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 our relationship with God. We've divorced it as it's something that's out there, but actually it's tied to the very person of Christ. And we've got to come back. He's that focal point. He's that anchor point that everything springs from. And because he will never change, our standing will never change. Do you think God knew what, do you think God knew what he was doing? And isn't it wonderful how he's put all of these pieces together? And so from before the beginning of time, before the beginning of time, God, or God put all of these things into place to orchestrate that. And so when, when Adam and Eve sinned here, God wasn't wringing his hands, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? No, because he knew what Christ, God the Son, was going to accomplish on our behalf. And it's because of Christ. And so to see this here, underline it, it's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. It's not because of me that I'm in Christ Jesus. It's because of him we're in Christ, who has become our righteousness. He's our holiness and our, and our redemption. So huge. So let's pause to illustrate how foolish the thinking is of those who, who think that their good works will make them holy, holy before God. And I'm going to use this illustration again. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good illustration, but... Um, my wife gives me the Dickens when I use it, but it's still a good illustration. Remember, remember Adam, and we, used, we talked about Adam, Adam, in his perfect, Adam in his perfect state when he was created was, was perfect, wasn't he? There was no sin in his, in, his, in his spirit, soul, in his body. But when he chose to sin, what happened? What happened to, what happened to it all? Completely corrupted, didn't it? And then if that wasn't bad enough, what did Adam do? The moment that we were conceived, what does Adam do? And I'm probably not going to pour it in here very good. Uh, my hands are a little bit shaky. So what, is Adam, what did Adam do? Who he was in his sin was poured into us, wasn't it? And I won't, I'll just for the sake of time, I'm not going to follow through with that. But then if that wasn't bad enough, what did we continue to do in our own self, didn't we? We continue to add to it. We continue to, to corrupt ourselves even further, even further and further. So here's what, we all, here's what we look like, like a holy God. Now here's the question. Can we purify ourselves by the things that we do? If I really promise, if I promise never to sin again, is that going to purify me? If I, how many good works would I need to do? If I did this and I did this for the rest of my life, if I mother trees and did everything, will that purify me before a holy God? Absolutely not. See, these actions, if, see, think about this. If I tried through my own works to purify myself, these actions are coming from the thinking and the action of someone who is completely corrupted in sin. If these, whatever I try to think of to make myself right is being generated by one who's corrupted in sin, and a holy God cannot accept that. These actions are motivated by pride and, and self-effort. So in the end, whatever it is that I try to do to make myself more right with God, all I'm doing is contributing to my sin because it's motivated by pride and self-effort. And so I'm just corrupting myself even further and further. Our only hope is one who is already holy would step in and provide, provide us with his holiness. We can't fix ourselves, only God can. And to that end, as we saw earlier, and to that end, what does Christ do? His blood was poured out so that he could provide his holiness for us. And so as a result of that, we were made completely purified, completely, completely holy, as if there was no sin in the past, no sin in the present, and no sin in the future. Christ provides this for us through what he, what he has provided. Our holiness is complete forever because of Christ's one offering. There's nothing more to add. Rules and good works can't make us right with God before, and it can't keep us right thereafter. Any sin that we commit thereafter can't change our perfect standing, regardless of whatever it is. I made, I'm going to continue to have bad, I'm going to have continue to have bad, bad attitudes or, and do, but does that affect my standing before God? No, because his offering, he died once for all, 
And that is good enough and sufficient for absolutely everything that will come thereafter. That is the provision of Christ. And so when we see this for him, so Christ who has become our righteousness, he's become our holiness, and it's, it's, it's guaranteed, it's settled and settled because of Christ. This is what Christ provided from first to last. Isn't he good? And so we've got to see this. We've got to see this as Christ hung on this cross, as he hung and took all of our sin, all the sin of, of the whole entire world. He's, we weren't even on the earth at this point in time. And but Christ, what did he declare about all of our sin in the future? It is what? It is finished. And we've got to see our standing before God is. So let me try to illustrate how man-made rules treat God as foolish. Think about that. If I want a small child to do something for me, what do I, what do, I do for a child? How do I motivate a child to do what I want? Bribe him, right? Give him something he wants, something simple, maybe like candy. So in this light, what are people saying about God as they try to force him to accept him by their rules and their behavior? What are they saying about Almighty God? What are they saying about God? Sorry, he's not enough. What else are they saying about God? He can be manipulated, right? Just like I can manipulate that child. I can manipulate God. What else are they saying about God? That he's foolish, aren't they? Isn't that what they're saying? So these rules here, whatever it is, whatever this behavior is that we're trying to do to make God accept us or to smile on us, to have more favor on us, what are we saying about God? Are we not slapping him in the face and saying, God, you are foolish. I am smarter than you are. Yeah. We're just deepening our rebellion. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Not so true. We're also not seeing that God is absolute owner, are we? And God is, not a def God is not the definition of holiness. We are in our sin. And so now think about this. Looking at who God is in his majesty and his glory, is he to be trifled with? Is he foolish? Do we dare say that he's foolish? Do we dare set ourselves up to be greater than he is? Do we dare set ourselves up as the standard of what, what he will accept? See, now there's two sides of this here that we've got to see this. There's both the side as we come in, but then as we try to even as a, live as a believer, we somehow believe that if I read my Bible, God's going to smile on me. If I do this, God's going to be kind to me. If, oh, look out, if I didn't go to church on Sunday, oh my goodness, I better watch out, God's going to get me. So what are we saying? What are we saying? What are we believing? That we can manipulate him by what we do. We're saying that our standing somehow is dependent upon who we are, not on who Christ is. We're also saying that, that Jesus' death was not necessary or enough for sin. Somehow I've got to continue to perform. I've got to do something. I've got to do something more. We reject God's word and judgment about the payment for sin. We speak lightly of what dishonors God, saying that sin is no real big deal, and we lift ourselves up in pride, thinking that we can fix ourselves. And so the question is, what will an unbeliever say when they stand before God who are resting on their own man-made rules, trying to manipulate God to accept them? What's it going to be like as they stand before God? And then here's another question for us as believers in Jesus Christ. If we don't believe that, our, that Jesus has provided absolutely everything for us, that we're completely accepted, there's nothing more, there's no need for any other performance. I don't need to do anything to make God smile on me any more than he already does. If we don't believe that truth, what are we going to say when we stand before Almighty God, stand before Christ, who said, it is finished, when we doubt him at every turn? What are we going to say before him if we speak doubts over what he's provided. See, it's not, it's not based on performance in any, way, in any way, shape, or form. So let's apply this. Are we holy before God because of what we did or what Christ did? See, that's where it comes down to. Am I, am I right standing with God because of what he did or because of what I did? You see, if it comes down to I said the prayer or I went forward or I was really sorry for my sin, who am I resting on? Myself, am I? 
And so as we come by repentance and faith, complete saying, God, I'm completely helpless. There's nothing I can do to earn your, your, your righteousness. There's nothing that I can do. And rejecting my own way and trusting only in him, our righteousness is based on Christ. It's not by works, it's by faith, isn't it? Christ alone. So what must we do to keep ourselves secure and holy before God? See, there's two questions here. What brings me in? What keeps me in? See, so many of us are saying, yes, I came by repentance and faith completely outside of myself, but now it all depends on what I do as a believer. I keep myself pure. I keep myself right with God. If our righteousness was filthy rags coming in, is our righteousness not filthy rags thereafter? Because who is our righteousness? Christ is our righteousness. It doesn't rest on our performance. It doesn't rest on what we do. My one-time repentance and faith secures it forever. You see, our security rests in the person of Christ. He is our holiness. He is our right standing. So now, I had a thought here. Maybe this is a crazy thought, but think about this for a moment. As God came down to Sinai, And he demonstrated his absolute holiness with the thunder and the lightning and the smoke and the fire and the earthquake and the thundering voice. That just magnifies how absolutely holy he is. Do we as believers in Jesus Christ realize that because of Christ, we are that holy as well? Have you ever made that connection before? I I would just overwhelm me as I was thinking about this last night, that before God, as, as, as Israel cowered in fear at this incredible, majestic view of God's holiness, do we as believers in Jesus Christ realize that's how holy we are? Not because of me, but because of Christ. And it's so huge for us as believers in Jesus Christ to realize that it doesn't depend on who I am. It doesn't depend on what I do or how I perform. He completed it from first to last. Isn't that powerful? So let me illustrate how our relationship with Christ is the same as a loving marriage. It's, It's secure, not based on rules. So think about that. If a husband gave a list of rules to his wife, what kind of marriage would they have? Is the husband out to work one day? So here, now today, it's here. This is what you got to do. And listed out 20 rules. Boom, 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 boom. And at the end of the day, came back. Okay, how'd you do? How'd you do? What kind of marriage would they have? Not a very loving one, right? It's all based on what? Works. Works performance. Fear. So, so why doesn't a loving marriage need rules? Why doesn't a loving marriage need rules? What do you think? Why doesn't a loving marriage need rules? Yeah, trust we have in our spouse. What else? The love is the motivation. Because of our love for each other, our respect for each other, we choose to do, we choose to to honor them, don't we? So in the same way, a believer's relationship with Christ isn't based on rules or performance. We are so overwhelmed with all that Christ provided for us and his love that we choose to honor him in every area of our lives. It's not because we have to, but we want to. The reality is that Christ doesn't stand over us with a stick. But how many of us live as if Christ is standing over us with a stick? Why, do, why would we believe that? I know I lived that way many years as, as, a, as, a, as a young believer. I believe that God had this stick. It's do or else. Somebody else told me, it's like, okay, it's not like God had his foot on my neck and it was do or else. Why, do, why would we choose to believe that? Because we don't understand who God is, right? If we're thinking it's all based on who we are, Rules and performance didn't bring us into this relationship with God, nor will it keep us. God brought us in, and he is the one who keeps us in. All that we have is because of Christ. Amen?